Hey guys, I wanted to tell you I'm offering a free weight loss virtual Bible study. Now is the perfect time to focus on understanding true hunger and fullness and learn what the Bible has to say about it. All you have to do is go to ChantelRayWay.com slash Bible study. After you sign up, you'll receive a six week Bible study video that you can watch on your own or you can get a small group of people and do it together. That's ChantelRayWay.com slash Bible study for your free six week Bible study course. One of the things I've realized is that there's so many chemicals in laundry detergent and the soaps out there. So I either make it myself, it's actually pretty easy, or I use my green fills. If you go to ChantelRayWay.com slash soap, I'll give you my free recipe for laundry soap. Or if you just feel like buying one that's really clean and not filled with tons of chemicals, you can get it there. ChantelRayWay.com slash soap. Hey guys, I'm on my way home from being on national TV talking about intermittent fasting and I'm answering the question, does intermittent fasting help you lose weight? Maybe you guys have tried intermittent fasting and lost some weight, but now you might just be stuck in a rut where you're not losing as much as you want. Well, I've interviewed over a thousand thin eaters and I've learned that intermittent fasting is just one of the tools they use, but there's so many more. There's nine other principles that they use to stay thin. To get out of your rut, click here to watch this free video. Hey guys, I'm so excited to introduce to you Dr. Ken Berry, who is amazing. And we are talking today a lot about what do you do when you're in a rut and you feel like the scale is not moving. So Dr. Berry, welcome and tell listeners a little bit about you for those who don't know you yet. Well, thank you very much for having me. I am a family physician. I have practiced clinical medicine um, for 20 years. I've had uh, several years experience in emergency room medicine, a year or two experience in labor delivery, but the bulk of my practice has been clinical medicine, just seeing patients Monday through Friday in the clinic. Um, And during that time, at one point, I became a morbidly obese, pre-diabetic, very inflamed physician and uh, basically had to go back to the drawing board and say, wait a minute, if I can't keep myself healthy, how am I supposed to help other people maximize their health? And uh, so that took me on a kind of a deep into the rabbit hole journey, studying and basically restudying and relearning human nutrition and what that means, both the eating of human nutrition, what to eat, what not to eat, and also not eating. <clears throat> How safe is fasting? How big a deal is fasting? How powerful is fasting? And so that's kind of what's landed me here at this current juncture is is that journey of self-improvement and then sharing what I've learned both by personal experience, by clinical experience, and by really trying to engulf the research that's out there and synthesize that in a way that I can help just regular people with a spouse and a job and a dog and, you know, hopes and aspirations, I can kind of help them understand what all that means when you put all that together. Awesome. So one of the questions, so today I want to ask you some of the questions that we are getting on a constant um, basis, like over and over and over. And this first question is, um, just about being cold. And she starts off by saying, Burr, I'm feeling always, I'm always feeling cold when I'm fasting. Is this common with other people? Some people get used to it and others like me just never get used to it. What are some of the reasons that I'm constantly freezing when I'm fasting? So after the initial kind of uh, equilibration phase, Uh, when you're starting to do some intermittent fasting or longer fasts, it's going to take your metabolism to get used to that. It's going to take some time. And, you know, you may have come from the standard American diet and you were eating three meals a day with snacks in between. So basically you were grazing all day. And so it looks like it takes a few days or a few weeks, maybe even a month or two for your metabolism to remember, oh, wait a minute, I can run just fine burning fat for fuel. I don't have to have carbohydrates every two hours. And so there's probably a a period of balancing out there for a few days, weeks, or a month or two. That's And that happens almost to everybody when they really start to implement some meaningful intermittent fasting or longer fasts into their lifestyle. 
But the two most common reasons after you're fat adapted and after you've been fasting for a while, if you're chronically cold, then one of two things is probably the matter. Uh, probably the most, well, I don't know, maybe a tie for which one's the most common, but it's very common, especially in women, because very often one of our goals is to lose weight, which we mean, what we mean by that is to lose fat. That's what, one of our goals of fasting. And so for, for women, especially not all women, but most, they, they hear, they have their mother's voice hardwired in their subconscious or their grandmother's voice or their aunt's voice. And anytime you are trying to lose weight or diet, you have to portion control and calorie restrict. That has to be part of it. And that's actually not true at all. But that's what we remember being taught when we were very, very young. And very often, the lessons that you were taught as a child, even though they're completely incorrect, that you carry them into adulthood as self-evident truth, even though there's no truth to them at all. And so very many, many women who are trying to eat a low-carb diet, plus or minus fasting, or just fasting, they will just innately start to, to calorie restrict or portion control. And so when they're in their feeding window or their feasting window, they're still trying to eat these bird-sized portions that they think that the world looking over their shoulder would approve of. And when you're fasting and plus or minus a low-carb diet, you don't have to do that. One of the beautiful things of it is when you are eating, when you're in your feasting window, it should be a feast. You should eat until you're comfortably stuffed. If you're not doing that, then you are going to lower your metabolic rate because basically you're back to portion control and calorie restricting and your body interprets that as a famine. And so your body's like, oh, there's not enough protein and fat in, in this current environment. I better lower the metabolic rate so that we can conserve energy. And one of the ways your body does that is by lowering your body temperature, your basal body temperature. And it might lower it uh, a quarter of a degree or half a degree. And a lot of people feel that as I'm cold all the time, my fingers are cold, my feet are cold. And that's because when, when you're fasting, you should be eating nothing. But when you're feasting, you should be eating a, meal that satisfies you that you're comfortably stuffed when you're done with that meal whether you're eating one meal a day two meals a day or whatever however your fasting regimen breaks up when you do eat you have to eat like you mean it or your body's going to interpret that as a famine uh, and you will lower your metabolic rate that's number one number two is it's very very common in modern society for the diet that we eat even if it's an organic non-gmo as as you know as, as nature-based as possible, it's very common for that diet to be deficient in iodine. And iodine is an essential element that every cell in your body has to have. It's not just about your thyroid gland. It's about every cell in your body needs iodine. And so if your iodine's uh, deficient, one of the ways, one of the symptoms that's going to manifest as is I'm always the coldest person in the room. My fingers are cold. My feet are freezing all the time. Uh, if there's, if I'm in a room with 50 people, I'm the person saying, can we turn up the heat, please? And that it can actually mimic low thyroid or hypothyroid symptoms in the respect of fatigue and always being the coldest person in the room. But it's just that you're not getting enough iodine in your diet because it's actually in modern society, it's quite hard to get enough iodine. For many people, it's a combination of number one and number two. Uh, for some people, it's more of their portion controlling or calorie restricting. For other people, they're just super deficient in iodine. Yeah, it's funny because, you know, the foods that I can think of that are high in iodine are eggs, shrimp, tuna, dairy, <clears throat> seaweed, stuff like that. And it's funny that when I eat the, those foods, I don't really love seaweed salad, but I had some the other day and I was like, oh, I don't really like this. But literally after I ate it, I started feeling like a million bucks or like yep. shrimp, eggs. And I was like, those foods, when I eat them, I just literally can feel my whole body feeling better. So Absolutely. I am definitely, I feel like I definitely am a little bit iodine deficient because when I if I eat those, I just feel like I kind of have a pep in my step. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I've heard that report from hundreds of people, including my wife, 
who has Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And so there's a myth out there that if you have Hashimoto's, you should avoid uh, foods containing iodine. It's absolutely false. And let's dig into that a little deeper. Every cell that has been studied in the human body has something called a sodium iodine symporter. And it's basically a little machine on your cell membrane that grabs iodine in your extracellular fluid and pulls it inside the cell. That requires energy in the form of ATP to, to work that little machine to get the iodine inside the cell. Every single cell we've ever looked at, and I, I talk about this in my YouTube videos on YouTube about iodine, and I actually have the research in the links below, uh, every cell, the, your skin cells, your kidney cells, your heart cells, your brain cells, they all have sodium iodine symporters, and the human body is, is very smart. It's never going to waste energy doing something that's not important. And so the fact that we have these little machines on every cell membrane of every cell we've ever studied means that iodine is important to the optimal function of that cell. Does that make sense? And so anytime you hear a guru or an influencer or an expert say anything about, oh, you better, you better watch your intake of iodine for the following reason, you can rest assured they really haven't looked very deeply into the matter. Every cell in your body needs iodine for optimal function. And that's why when you ate that seaweed salad or the mollusks or the crustaceans or the fish that come from the ocean, it's, it's almost like a light switch is on like, Ooh, I feel better. That's why is because your cells that are craving that iodine, you, you made them happy by giving them a good dose of that iodine. So what do you think about, you know, most table salt has been iodized. And so they, people, some people say, well, if you just have iodized salt, you're going to get all the iodine that you need. How would you respond to that? Yeah, that's a, actually a, 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 first of all, a terrible way to get iodine in your diet is from iodized salt. That is a, a governmental invention that the federal government came up with back around the time of World War I because all of the young guys they were trying to enlist or draft into the military had gorders because they were iodine deficient because in the middle of the, of our, of the United States, kind of the geographical middle of it, it, the soil is very, very depleted in iodine because they're so far from the ocean. And so all these guys had a gorder. And so they're like, how can we get iodine into the, into the society in general? And they said, well, let's just let's have salt companies put it in the salt. So that's number one. It's an artificial construct right off the bat. So, but, but we all grew up with that. So it feels natural to us because as children, we knew, we're like, wait, what does this mean, iodized? And we you know, looked it up or whatever our mother told us. That doesn't mean that's a natural way of doing it. It's very unnatural. Secondly, when the salt sits on the shelf in the warehouse or in the big box store or in your pantry for a few months, most of the iodine will sublimate out. And this is something that uh, many of the elements can do. They can bypass, they can go from a solid to a gas, and they can skip the liquid phase. And so most of the iodine is gone in that salt that you think is iodized. Uh, also, sea salts are a terrible source of iodine. A lot of people just think all salt has iodine, and that's not true at all. It might have a tiny bit. Redmond's real salt from uh, the Salt Lake in Utah, that, that has a tiny bit of iodine. Himalayan pink sea salt, if it's real, has a tiny bit of iodine in it, but not enough to give you your daily needs. And so it's really important that you not trust salt as your primary means of getting iodine, because even if you buy a, freshly, a fresh box of iodized salt and no sublimation has happened, there's still not enough iodine in that to give you everything that all your cells need. There is enough iodine to keep you from forming a gorder, which is a swollen, inflamed thyroid, but there's not enough iodine in salt ever to give you enough iodine for all of your body cells. So let's back up for just a second and talk about, I want you to answer the question, first of all, what is Hashimoto's disease? Because I think that a lot of us pretend like everyone knows, but what is Hashimoto's mm. disease? What causes Hashimoto's disease? And what's the difference between Hashimoto's and hypothyroidism? 
So Hashimoto's thyroiditis is an autoimmune condi uh, condition of inflammation of the thyroid gland caused by your immune system actually attacking parts of your thyroid gland. Uh, and no one knows exactly why that happens, but we have ample anecdotal evidence in the low-carb keto carnivore communities that Hashimoto's calms way down and gets way better when you remove the highly inflammatory processed grains and sugars and industrial vegetable oils, when you get all that stuff out of your diet, it seems to get better. So there's probably something in the modern diet that's causing this epidemic of Hashimoto's thyroiditis that we're currently seeing. That's number one. Number two is uh, hypothyroidism can ultimately result from Hashimoto's but you can actually have hyperthyroid symptoms from Hashimoto's as well and in the earlier stages of Hashimoto's. But ultimately what seems to happen is that the thyroid, after it's been under attack for, for many months or a few years by your own immune system is that it's damaged enough of your thyroid gland that you're just not able to make enough T4, which converts to T3, to have a normally functioning thyroid again, and so you become hypothyroid or low, have a low thyroid condition. So Hashimoto's ultimately leads to hypothyroidism, and it can give you hypothyroid symptoms even when your the lab results your doctor might check still looks like your euthyroid or normal. You may already have multiple of the multiple, multiple symptoms of hypothyroidism with Hashimoto's. Hey guys, one of the things that will take your weight loss to the next level is coaching. You can either work one-on-one -on -one with me or one of our certified private coaches. If you'd like, you can schedule your free call. It's a 10-minute strategy call just to see if coaching is going to really take you to the next level. The other thing is listening to the audiobook. Listening to the audiobook and getting the video course that I've done, people are seeing dramatic results. If you just listen to the audiobook 30 minutes a day over and over and over again and get the video course, go to ChantelRayway.com and check out the video course. You won't be sorry you did. Hey guys, I want to tell you about a great product that you absolutely cannot live without, and it's called Digest Aid. When you're stressed, you might not be able to produce as much stomach acid. And if you're eating a little more right now and you're stressed, you need help to digest your food. My Digest Aid that I created has enzymes that are capable of doing just that. It has both betaine HCL, not just HCL, but an enzyme pepsin that helps your body digest your food, which is really unique. And right now, all of our products are 30% off. Go to ChantelRayway.com, click on store, and get yours for 30% off. Just use the promo code PODCAST. I don't know about you guys, but I've been doing a ton of cooking lately, and I've been having so many new recipes. Go to ChantelRayway.com slash free recipes to get the best kale dressing recipe you'll ever have, the dairy-free artichoke dip that you will love for completely free. I also want to give you my entire free smoothie book that has the best smoothies. One of the things that can help you lose weight is just to replace one of your meals with an amazing smoothie. So if you're eating two meals, just make one of them a smoothie. You can get my free amazing recipe book at chantelrayway.com slash free recipe. And our protein shakes are amazing as well. And right now they're 30% off. Go to chantelrayway.com, click on store and use podcast for the 30% off your protein shake. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And so for you, like, what do you say to people who, cause I have seen studies out there that say, you know, if you have Hashimoto's that you should avoid iodine. And okay. they say, the other thing is the other piece is that uh, dairy has a lot of iodine in it. And so it's funny because I always tell people, you know, if I try to not have gluten and dairy, those are the two things I try to avoid on my diet. But if I was going to like, just be like, I'm falling off the wagon. I'm eating whatever the heck I want. The one thing that I like am like to die for is a slice of Ezekiel toast with cottage cheese on top. And people are like, you know, like <laughs> for me, that would be like, oh my gosh, I would <laughs> go crazy for that. 
Um, so what do you say to the people who say that iodine is could can actually is not good for that? What what is your combat for that? Well, basically, when they say that, that just reveals a, a lack of understanding or a misunderstanding of human physiology. It would it's really along the same lines of saying, well, you have to be adequately hydrated in order to get pregnant. So like if you're, you know, if you're very dehydrated chronically, that's going to make it harder for you to get pregnant, right? Okay, yeah, we can all agree on that. So that would then they would say, well, if, so if you don't want to get pregnant, you better not drink too much water because if you get overly hydrated, that's going to increase your risk of getting pregnant. No, no, that no, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever, right? So being adequately hydrated is a, a prerequisite for getting pregnant. You have to have adequate hydration, but drinking more water is not going to make you at risk of becoming pregnant. That doesn't work that way. And the same goes with thyroid function. You need iodine in order to manufacture T4 and the other, uh, the other thyroid hormones that the thyroid gland manufacturers. But if you have too much iodine, you're not in any way going to become hyperthyroid in regards to, oh, you're making so much extra unnecessary thyroid hormone because you're taking this extra iodine supplement. That doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, and then the sources of iodine, you always have to remember this. Iodine is an element. It's on the periodic table of the elements, right? You cannot make iodine and neither, neither can the cow that produced the dairy or the cow that produced the liver. If what the cow is eating is deficient in iodine, then that milk, that, that egg yolk, that uh, cheese, that butter is also not gonna be a good source of iodine. Theoretically, uh, fatty dairy products should be, egg yolk should be a good source of iodine, but if the chicken was eating feed that was iodine depleted, that chicken nor the cow, can they cannot perform nuclear fusion in their body, like, like in the center of the sun. They cannot create that element. It's either in their diet or it's not in their body. That you, yet yeah, everybody has to agree on that. And so, yes, theoretically, you know, fatty dairy products and egg yolks and other things should be a good source of dairy, but they're not always, depending on what the animal eat. Most things that are actually grown in the sea, the sea vegetables, the seaweed, the seafood, mollusks, crustaceans, fish, they, the ocean is a good source of iodine. It's, it has a good supply in just ocean water, and so they're going to be a pretty good source consistently of iodine. Now, you got to always watch out for the farm raised. If they're raised in an artificial environment and not actually in the wild ocean, they may also not be a good source of iodine. Right. And, it, you know, I think one of the things I always say is to really listen to your body, um, what your body needs. Like, for example, if, if my, my son starts to get a little bit of a cold or he starts to get run down, he'll literally ask me, he'll be like, mom, I'm craving orange juice. Can I have some orange juice? Like he just naturally tends to that. And so you have to ask yourself, like, like for me, I told you I crave eggs or I'll crave, you know, dairy or crave tuna or crave shrimp. That's probably telling me, my body is telling me I'm iodine deficient. You know, I need probably yes. my body's Most, telling yeah. me. Yeah. Many I'm of our cravings do mean that you have a physiological need for some mineral or some vitamin. Um, I think some of our some of our cravings have our uh, constructs, our, our you know, our mom always gave us this when we were sick or, or our grandmother always said, oh, you should drink this or eat this. So like in the Southern United States, I don't know if it's this way everywhere, but if you start to get a stomach virus, you start to crave seven up or Sprite because that's what every grandmother and mother in the Southern United States gives you if you have a stomach virus. You, and so you come to associate that with, oh, I don't know, I must need something in the seven up or Sprite. And that's obviously not true. There's nothing in there except sugar and this. But we, we falsely learn that as a craving. So I don't think every craving means that you're looking for a, an essential vitamin or mineral, but some of them do, absolutely. Mm. 
Okay. This next, this question is from Alexandra. I'd like for you to answer it. It says, should you take supplements when you're fasting? Should I wait until my eating window? I'm a creature of habit and I always take them in the morning. If I wait until my eating window, I'm forgetting and not taking them. Will I break my fast if I'm taking supplements? But just remember, if I don't do it in the morning, I'm not going to end up taking it. I will always yep. forget. Alexandra. It's yeah, great question. First of all, I don't think that any supplement <clears throat> in the form of a capsule or a pill or a gel cap is going to meaningfully break your fast. I don't think that's true at all. If you if you if you take them with some water, uh, whether sparkling or still. But the second problem is is how much of that vitamin or mineral are you going to actually absorb and make bioavailable inside your system. And the answer for some of them is not much at all if you're fasting. Uh, four of the vitamins, vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E, and vitamin K are fat soluble. And so if you just take those on an empty stomach, especially if they're not in a, an oil-filled gel cap, then you're, you're gonna, not going to absorb any of that. And so what I would say to do is, is you probably need to take most of your vitamins and minerals and supplements with food. That's how most of them are absorbed the best. There's this thing on your phone now. Uh, there's a person you can talk to whose name starts with an S and you can say, hey, so-and-so, wake me up at 5 p.m. And you, that's it. You're done. And so then when that alarm goes off, you're like, ah, oh, it's time to take my supplements or whatever time you're going to break your fast. Just have your phone. Just tell your phone with a voice to a voice command to wake you up at that time. So the alarm goes off and you're like, why is that? Oh, yeah, I got to take my supplements. It's, and with modern technology, it's very easy because I'm that way as well. If I'm having to take a medication two or three times a day, I'm damn sure going to forget at least one, if not two of those doses. I'm just not going to do that. But you don't want to take an expensive supplement and then just pee and poop it out because you didn't absorb it. That doesn't help you at all. But no, I don't think taking supplements breaks your fast, but you're probably wasting the majority of whatever's in the supplement because you're just not absorbing it. All right. This next question is from our Facebook group, Mary Lewis. Can I hear from you all that it took a long time to see results on the scale and also in your clothes? I seem <clears throat> to be one of those people. And yes, I've tried changing things up many times and it has not worked. What do you tell women that are have been that are having trouble, but have been consistent since September. Also, I lost a lot last year doing this and it was easy. Why is it not now? Yeah. So first of all, for every woman listening, who's 40 years of age or older, if you're stalled on your fat loss, let's call it fat loss, not weight loss, because nobody wants to lose muscle and nobody wants to lose bone density. And nobody wants to lose the density of their cartilage, their tendons, or their ligaments. We don't want that. We want to lose fat. We want to burn fat off our body. And so for every woman 40 and older, if you're in a weight loss stall or a fat loss stall and you have not lost any weight in three months, six months, nine months, a year, the first thing I want to say to you is <clears throat> congratulations. And you're like, what? Here's why. What is the average, what happens to the average woman who's just eating the standard American diet or the American Diabetes Association diet, what happens to them every three months on average? They're they gain dating. a pound. They gain a pound. That's right. And so the average woman, if she just eat whatever and not doing anything, she's going to gain three to seven pounds every single year. So the fact that you have maintained your weight, that is a victory. So congratulations on that victory. Now, I understand your question. You're wanting to lose weight, damn it. And that's just <laughs> not happening. But you're not gaining weight. So already you're, you, are, you have beaten what's average for the average 40 and older woman. So that's good. So secondly, I've got a, a YouTube video that goes into all 13 reasons why you might stall really on any diet, but just specifically on low carb, keto, carnivore, plus or minus fasting. There's, there's a bunch of reasons. The most common reason is, is that you're doing the calorie restriction, portion restriction. That's very common and that's going to lower your metabolic rate. If you're not eating enough fatty meat in your diet, that it, even if you're gorging on low fat plants, to your body, that's a famine. It's going to lower your metabolic rate. You're just not going to burn fat as fast if you're doing that. 
many people notice when, and it can be fatty seafood or it can be fatty red meat. It doesn't really matter, but your body has to have animal fat in order to know, ah, oh, there's not a famine. Everything's good. I can go ahead. I don't have to store all this energy on my body anymore, which is what fat is. I can go ahead and burn some of that off because it's inefficient for your body to hold all this extra fat unless there's a famine. In which case, it's very it's very smart for your body to hold on to that fat. And so, if you're trying to portion control, calorie restrict, eat lots of you know raw salads and stuff, your body's like I don't know because. People have to understand the paleoanthropological evidence is very clear on this. Human beings as a species for the last quarter of a million years, we have eaten as much fatty meat as we could get our hands on. We eat veg if we, if we like the taste of it or if we need it to keep from starving to death. But fatty meat is a signal to our body all is well. There's no famine. You're in good shape uh, ecologically, so there's no reason to hold all this extra fat. Another very common reason for a stall is to have an undiagnosed hypothyroid condition. Many doctors will check just the TSH or they'll check a TSH and a free T4. And that, that in no way can thoroughly checks your thyroid gland function. Uh, my friend of mine, L. Russ, talks about the conversion of T4 to T3. A lot of people, they have a problem where they cannot convert T4 to T3, and T3 is the actual uh, meaningful thyroid hormone. And so you can have a completely normal TSH and free T4 and have a terrible conversion problem and be severely hypothyroid, and the doctor would be completely blind to it because they did not check a full thyroid panel. And I talk about what is a complete thyroid panel in multiple videos on Facebook and YouTube. And then also there's a website called Stop the Thyroid Madness that, that also lists that and has a ton of great resources. It's also very common for women over the age of 40 to have a gender hormone deficiency. Their testosterone and progesterone are very low, and this can really slow down your metabolic rate. Most people think of testosterone as a male hormone, but women absolutely have to have a certain amount of testosterone, but they're gonna suffer. They're gonna suffer many, many symptoms. And so for many women, uh, optimizing their testosterone and progesterone with a bioidentical hormone becomes necessary sometime during their life at 40, 50, 60, 70, if they don't just want to hold that extra 20, 30, 40 pounds for the rest of their life, that becomes needed at some point. And I go into all the other reasons why you might stall on that YouTube video, but those are probably the most common reasons. Awesome. All right. This next question is about drinking too many too much water. This is from Anonymous. How do you know if you're drinking too much water on your fast? I almost feel like I'm drinking more than my body is capable of excreting. When I'm fasting, I'm having a little bit of bloating, some headaches, and brain fog. I work at Geico, and they're not happy that I'm taking increased bathroom breaks. My boss has made some mentions that I'm going to the bathroom way too much. This is all while I'm fasting. How yeah. do you know if you're drinking too much water on your fast? So if you're drinking water when you're not thirsty, then you're, you're drinking too much water. And it's not necessarily that that's going to be bad for you, but you're going to have to go pee every two hours. And if you dilute your serum enough, you could actually become uh, low on sodium low on potassium or magnesium, and it can make you feel very fatigued, very yucky, very, very absent-minded, plus you got to go pee every two hours. There's this huge belief in the health and nutrition space on social media that drinking lots of water is mandatory for, for fat loss, for good health, to, to cleanse your liver, to cleanse your kidneys. There is no physiology behind that. There's no, no physiological truth behind that whatsoever. It makes just as much sense to eat when you're not hungry as it does to drink water, to gorge on water, to push water when you're not thirsty. Your body is hardwired. You're going to drink when you're thirsty, okay? If you get thirsty enough, you'll drink mud puddle water. 100% you will, okay? You'll drink, you'll drink ocean water if you get truly thirsty enough. So don't think that, oh, because you hear this myth, oh, well, our thirst, blah, 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 you need to drink so many ounces per pound of body or so many 
No, all that's bunk. All that's busy work to keep you busy thinking you're actually doing something. And what it's really doing is wasting your time and wasting your effort that you could be applying to something that actually is going to help you lose fat and get healthier, which is watching the foods you eat and making sure that they're physiologically appropriate. Uh, If you're thirsty, drink. If you're not thirsty, don't drink. The end. That's it. And so stop believing that you need to gorge on water or that somehow over drinking water is healthy. It's not. And actually, if you if you really force the issue and drink too much, you, you can you can develop hyponatremia, which is a very low sodium that can be quite dangerous and quite serious. It's hard to do, but it's possible. But if you're not thirsty, don't drink. That'll solve that problem and it'll make your employer happier as well. Yeah, I actually know somebody, I didn't know them, but I heard of a story that, um, you know, they got overhydrated and they actually <clears throat> died. They did a, like a marathon race yep. and they drank too much water. And after the marathon race, they actually died from drinking too happen. much water. It can happen. Yeah. Okay. This next question says, I'm worried about eating tuna because I've heard that they are filled with parasites. Even though tuna is highly nutritious, I heard that eating it raw may pose some risks. Can you tell me how high of a risk? And I love tuna. I don't want to give it up, but I already feel like I have parasites. So how do I fix it? So I've been practicing clinical medicine for 20 years. And in that 20 years, I've not seen a single person who uh, got a parasite from eating either cooked or raw tuna. I've not seen that a single time. And I have been looking before you say that. I actually, I actually do believe parasites are a thing and I have been looking for them for several years. Uh, but there's a lot of mythology behind parasites out there on the internet that can really spook you and make you just afraid of everything. Uh, that's number one. The thing you might worry about with tuna and other kind of uh, apex predator fish like swordfish is is the mercury content. And so I tend to focus on eating smaller fish, uh, smaller cold water fish. They don't eat big fish, and so they don't really magnify the mercury content that winds up being in their flesh. So I'll focus more on sardines, anchovies, mackerel, herring, and uh, cold water fish like that that are wild caught. I'm not getting nearly the amount of mercury that I'm getting in uh, tuna or swordfish. But as far as the the pair, I mean, if you if you're going to eat some raw tuna and it stinks, it's it's ruined. Don't eat that. That's bad. That's your that's your hardwired sense of don't eat that. But if it's fresh and it's been properly handled, the the chances of you getting a parasite from eating raw tuna are astronomically small. Awesome. Awesome. Well, this has been so amazing. Tell listeners where they can find you and where they can follow you. So I have this book called Lies My Doctor Told Me, and it's available in paperback, uh, Kindle, and an audible version. If you're like me and you're spoiled and you don't actually like to read books, you like to listen to them, there's an audible too, and it's available wherever you buy your books at. I have a, a YouTube channel that has I actually just went over a million subscribers and I have over 270 videos on my YouTube channel. You can watch for free about fat loss, about low carb diets, about I have a, actually a playlist called fasting 101 that I, it's probably has 40 or 50 videos in it just about fasting. I have a lot of videos about uh, hormones, male and female about thyroid uh, adrenal, all kinds of stuff I talk about on the YouTube. And I do have uh, one on there about parasites, I think. It's been a minute since I made that. I also have a Facebook page where I do a lot of work. My wife, Nisha, and I, we go live every Monday night at 7 p.m. Central and talk about, you know, health and nutrition-related news articles and the latest stupid thing we heard somebody say on the Internet. And then we also do a lot of uh, – we take a lot of questions like you do and try to help people understand their health both – mental and physical, both medically and nutritionally. And I'm also on Twitter and Instagram and Vero and TikTok and Gab and everywhere else. But those are my my main three that I focus on. That's awesome. Well, if you have a question that you want answered, go to questions at ChantelRayway.com. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.